Hello, everybody. This is Roger Derling, Executive Director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And I am so honored to uh, have Catherine O'Brien uh, with us today. Catherine um, has done award-winning short films that have played numerous film festivals. Her first feature film, The Auto uh, uh, Automatic Hate, uh, which she co-wrote, uh, premiere at the 2015 South by S Southwest and played top international film festivals, um, winning the audience award at the Mill Valley F uh, Film Festival. And then her directorial debut uh, came in 2019. Um, and the film is called Lost Transmissions, so starting starring Simon Pegg and Juno Temple. And in 2020, um, it won the top award at the Prague Film Festival. Um, before I start talking to you, Catherine, let's take a, a peek at uh, Lost Transmissions, a scene from the film. Thea. Hannah, can you please direct me? This, this, this exit here. Oh, I see. I don't want to go to the fucking hospital. I don't want to go. You just want to lock me up and tell me you're going to talk to me. Calm him down. Get off me, you fuck. We all know you're not pregnant. Someone stuck a fucking bomb up you. They should take you to a field and detonate you somewhere. Stop. Jesus Christ! Hey, hey, get him! Fucking get the wheel! Come on, get the fucking wheel! Get him off me! Get him off me! Get the wheel! 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 Get the Calm down. What the fuck was Where that? What the Let's fuck pull over. Was that, Can we pull over? All right. Welcome, Catherine. Um, I I told you that before we came uh, uh, live that I, that I have such great admirations for this film, seeing it a second time, and um, I was in particular struck by your 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 take on it. Um, uh, it, I mentioned that it won the top prize at the Prague Film Festival, and the 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 European influence in the film, like mm -hmm. the the Czech New Wave, yes. Miller, Miller's Forgeman, Foreman's film, is so palpable in in your in your uh, directing of this uh, film. Can you talk about yeah. about that? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Um, I don't know if we've talked about that before, but I'm no, so no, glad, we didn't. Yeah, I'm so glad you picked it up because it's something that I I haven't really gotten the chance to talk about much. But yeah, you're, you're spot on that the, those Eastern European and Czech New Wave filmmakers were like the direct influence for the approach to this film. And, and why? And why? I mean, I I've seen the film and I know, but I want to hear from you why tied Czech New Wave and, and this subject matter? Yeah, so I mean, Czech New Wave and Milos Forman's one of my you know favorite filmmakers, um, but in this subject matter, you know, I always believe that, you know, I'm kind of a director that can be quite versatile, I think, when I approach things, because I really believe that something has in its DNA the way it wants to be treated, and I always want to be in service to whatever it's asking for. Um, and because this was so much about, it was a social commentary about the state of like mental health care in the States. I was really, you know, I really gravitated towards those Czech new waves because a lot of those um, Czech new wave filmmakers came up through like communist, um, you know, like communist era documentary filmmaking. And they at first made kind of propaganda films for the state, but then in their later films, they started using those, their, that, style of like that realism and that humanitarianism to make commentary about the state. So there's a lot of that in, you know, like early Milos Forman films, like Fireman's Ball, Loves of a Blonde, you know, all those things that I loved so much. And in particular, I kind of just, 
I love the way that they treated people. You know, there was a lot of humor. There's definitely a lot of humor in it, but they, but it never seems to be at the expense of the person. It always seems to show people and their and their full humanity. And there's um and they're if they're doing any satire, it's mostly poking satire at the at this you know um like this inescapable situation of just the system. So that's um you know that was really you know what influenced the look of the film you know like the also too like we were ha we had such a low budget that it really helped to embrace of you know kind of fly by the seat of your pants like uh, you know handheld filmmaking you know i don't think we would have been able to get our days in otherwise um but it's uh, yeah everything from the treatment and the color you know the color um, timing of the film it was all sort of kind of throwing back to look you know more like super 16 um uh, film and also um there was one other influence that um, that was uh, Gary Winogrand, the street photographer. Oh, okay. The, yeah, from yeah. the 1950s. He did a lot of like, you know, wide angle lenses because he was a street photographer and he was always shooting from the hip and wanting to catch everything and focus in that decisive moment, you know? If you saw somebody sitting on the sidewalk, like, you know, reaching out and he, you know, wanted he wanted to be able to like, take the, take the shot and have it all in focus and also not be noticed that he was taking the shot, so. A lot of his stuff influenced me too because he did a lot of stuff in LA in the 1950s. He does a lot of um, homelessness on you know the LA streets in the 50s, and here we are still today. It's even worse. But um, he also just had this surreal eye, and a lot of what you know is talked about in the film is sort of learning to empathize with Theo and what he's going through, and um, and kind of like see you know pick up on things that he's picking up on. And so it's very at, on one level it's it's you know, super realistic. And then on the other, there's just this twinge of surrealism where something is just a bit odd. And so that that's all that Lost Transmissions is about. It's like a very, you know, realistic problem, but also this kind of twinge of something surreal and, and bizarre as we start to kind of get pulled into the vortex of, of his mental state. Correct. I mean, the film, for those who haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to see it. And the film deals with mental illness. And um, while, while we're talking about, about the style of the film, the sound design mm. in, in, in the film is so powerful. We, you actually track the mental state of, of the two main characters. Um, you know, can you talk about your approach through sound to, to, to you know, help us understand the characters? Yeah, well, that's really, um, you know, both these characters, that's their wheelhouse being musicians in LA. He's a music producer. She's a, 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 a you know, fledgling singer songwriter. And they kind of communicate in this realm of sounds. And, um, and it's, it was something that it kind of came about because both of how it kind of fed into his delusions and then also just the way that they could connect with each other is is through that realm of sound so um you know that's kind of where the name of the film came from lost transmissions you know he's you know i often see you know my friends who are producers sitting there with various waveforms on their monitors and just imagining that he's you know in his particular delusions that that becomes significant and i have also there to me it was always sort of an analogy that um, we're all kind of functioning at these different wavelengths ourselves mentally. And oftentimes we just are missing each other. You know, like someone's on a frequency mm -hmm. going like this and then someone's on a frequency going like this and like, we're just not connecting. And so I kind of thought about these two characters who are sort of reaching for each other in the abyss and and those those signals are just getting lost and it's not connecting. Um, I'm curious, you know, you, you have had a lengthy experience as a writer, and this was your feature debut uh, of a screenplay that you had written. And all of these ideas about the sonic world that that is conveyed in the film, the style, um, how it's supposed to look, is that something that you were writing the script? You were you were also thinking how to visually tell the story? Yeah, I think this one from very early on, I had the idea of how I wanted to um, shoot it. And I was actually in, during the writing and rewriting, I would also, I would go out and I would shoot, um, you know, I would shoot Super 8 of Skid Row. I just do these kind of studies and, you know, and also just, um, 
you know, there's some 35 millimeter of the streets in LA and just to, just to put my head in, in the space of like how, you know, how I wanted it to look and feel. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Los Angeles. It, I've ne I don't recall seeing Los Angeles the way that you portray it. You know, we're used to seeing this sort of glamorous palm trees, et cetera. And this is a very gritty look. You know, can you tell us about your approach to Los Angeles? Yeah, it's funny. I think that, you know, I, I've gotten that comment a few times that people don't, you know, hadn't seen it portrayed like this. But I think that the LA as it's looking and feeling these days is a lot closer to what the film feels like now. It's, um, you know, just kind of post fires and post pandemic and things being boarded up and, the, you know, homeless population exploding. I think it it is feeling that very gritty um, these days. It's, uh, you know, I, um, there was there was this one you know dry, the experience of like living in LA it's like this accordion that always expands and has these secret worlds where you can drive up the hills and come to some you know a, go to a party at a Frank Lloyd Wright house or something and that's you know incredible and then the, also the experience is driving through just endless miles of strip malls and traffic and that to me is the LA that like this film was it was the 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 one that you pass through in the car and you're looking out your window at the streets and i think there's this disconnect because you'd always you'd see so much homelessness booming and it's such a disconnect from this world that just is the exporter of glam you know la is the export of glamour for the entire world and yet it's so incongruent with like what your experience is driving through the streets um and so i wanted to capture that experience of driving you know, like the drive through the streets you know like midtown and and for me, that was happening a lot when I would get off my exit at Silver Lake Boulevard it's from the 101. And, you know, you're just about to take Silver Lake Boulevard up into like, you know, the very, you know, cool neighborhood. And you have to go through this underpass that just was always, you know, housing a lot of, uh, you know, homeless encampments. And it was just, it was shocking to me. It was shocking that, that just a few blocks away from my house that this was just here. And I saw it every time I got off the freeway. So that was really, um, a generative image from the film. I went to Columbia University and Lewis Cole, who taught there, always talked about the generative image, which is just that one image that pops into your head. And if you, it's like a seed and if you could like unravel it, it has the DNA for the, for the entire thing. And, um, and it was sort of like the idea of running into your friend who might be down there and kind of, you know, not understanding what had happened to them. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's really was the approach to, you know, why, you know, we wanted it to look the way that we did. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as we mentioned, the film deals with mental illness and you don't sensationalize um, the, the mental illness nor romanticize it. Um, and there is a serial comic tone to, to the film. Was that, it was a difficult to find the balance, the tone of the, the piece? Yeah, and it changed. And, you know, when we were filming it, I made sure that we got, we'd always kind of do takes so that there would be a, a range, you know, something like both Juno and Simon are capable of delivering, you know, a, you know, such nuance. And I knew that the, that in the edit, the film would sort of tell us what it wanted to be in terms of where the tone would land. I think it ended up, we cut a lot of, we cut like several scenes that had more humorous moments in it. Um, because I felt like it strengthened um, Simon's performance uh, mm -hmm. and like the and the seriousness of his performance. Now I kind of wish that we had kept them in and maybe someday in another cut or maybe we will release them online because there are such good scenes. And I think that, you know, it, it really does make a difference when you're watching something that is dealing with subject matter like this that you do get just some relief, you know, to sustain you. So maybe they'll find their way back in someday, but um, <laughs> Yeah, including a scene with Rosanna Arquette at a party, which just, yeah, that I would love to have back in the film. But, uh, but, um, but yeah, it's, I think that um, the, the comedy in part comes from, um, it was, it was, the story was inspired through an experience I went through with a group of friends and the person that we were helping was very funny. Um, and a lot of his, you know, dealings at the time would end up being very humorous and I've just found that in these moments of crisis especially you know if someone's kind of talking weird it might be frightening the moment but then when you reflect on it afterwards you realize that it was like all ridiculous and it was kind of funny and I just think that for me at least for me humor is a way to deal with some of the hardest moments in life so that's 
you know, that's just sort of my own personal opinion about, you know, how to see the world and ways to handle it. And, and how did your friend feel about seeing his story on screen? Yeah, I mean, he was involved from the very beginning because, you know, oh, okay. yeah, I asked his per permission and then he consulted in the writing phase and um, he was, I mean, he was really touched. I think that for him, he'd said it definitely put into perspective um, the responsibility of how many people he affected during that time and, and how much he wants to make sure to be responsible um, to stay on his medication. And, um, but I think that it was in a way it opened up um, that group of friends being able to talk about it. It was nice because we, we talked about it. We were able to connect in, in the writing of the film and it helped friends that came together to make the film to talk about it and friends after to kind of like to process it. So it just opened up a lot of communication and it, it was very cathartic. I, I mean, in, 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 I've seen all of your shorts and of course I saw your previous, the film that you uh, wrote and this film, you're not, you, I, I, I love the fact that you deal with messy relationships <laughs> and, and also with subjects that you, at, at surface level, you will consider taboo um, and you bring them up, you know, out into the open. Is that something that, that you strive, that you enjoy doing? You know, it's something that I find that I end up doing even when I think I'm not, even when I think I'm trying to do something like straight down the middle genre, that it's, yeah, it's a story that is somewhat uncomfortable somehow. And um, I don't know why that is. It's, uh, I just kind of, I get um, excited by new stories. So I think that's part of it. Um, you know, finding something that hasn't been told before or not, or it's something that hasn't been told exactly in that way. And so um, maybe that's maybe that's part of the reason. The film I was working on next was a film that was um, about the persecution of um, these midwives and herbalists in um, Scotland in the 1500s during a during a plague time. So that's like, we've had to put the pause on that one just because it's not, it doesn't feel, it feels a little too on the nose at the moment. But um, yeah, again, it's sort of looking at a subject matter that we might all know very well through like genre horror films of witches, but sort of looking at the the origin of the myth of the witch and, and you know, what part, you know, the church might've played in that. And, you know, and uh, so that's, again, it's, it's just trying to find a different perspective is something that's always interest, interested me. And also, also the feedback loop of trying to change people's minds through film or trying to change like shift culture is something that has interested me. So that's that's part of it too, I guess. Um, it is the new the the project you were talking about. Is that something you're going to direct as well? Uh, yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> we'll see. Like I said, it's it's been put on pause, and so I'm working on some other things right now. Some, some TV and a, and a romantic comedy because you know I'm watching the the you know most fuzzy light warm things that I can so kind of just wanting to put that out into the world right now like you say like Juno doing Ted Lasso I think that was like this bomb that everybody needed so exactly um you know going back to lost transmissions um the uh, the usage of handheld camera um you know can you talk about that choice yeah it was um. Again, it was, you know, kind of wanted to hail to those documentary roots of those Eastern European filmmakers that influenced the film. Um, it was also, um, yeah, I wanted to feel real, wanted to feel connected, didn't want to, didn't want to make this glossy at all in the treatment of it. And, um, and also wanted to, we wanted to feel caught up in the whirlwind of, um, of the, you know, that Theo creates around him and felt that the destabilizing aspect, because that's something that I feel like is why it can be so hard to help people in that state is that um, it is destabilizing to, you know, I think it's something that, like I said, those, those transmissions that people send out is, it can be upsetting. And I think that, um, you know, as the film goes on, like we, we kind of feel Juno getting kind of caught up in it more and more, you know, the scenes where it goes down that um, twisting staircase at the Hollywood Hills house party and we go underwater and just wanted to feel um, kind of Juno going down the rabbit hole um, as she follows Theo across, you know, Los Angeles on this odyssey. I, I also, uh, I welcome the fact that it did not, 
it did not become this sexual relationship, this ro the, you know, romantic relationship. At first, I thought, oh, you know, we're, we're going to go down this this expected uh, route. And instead, you evade it. Um, you know, can you can you um, you know talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it definitely. Um, you know, with a lot of my friends who are musicians, I've noticed that there's this special relationship that develops between a, a musician and the, the producer, where the mm -hmm. producer is often almost kind of like a therapist because they're there to help the person emote, they're, you know, to, you know, get in touch with their inner feelings and things they're trying to express through their singing and like also helping them break through emotional blocks to be able to sing and access those places. And um, so that is what Theo sort of was for Hannah initially and then the role kind of switches and she, as she kind of becomes his caretaker and so that was the relationship the dynamic that i you know was interested in exploring was a, a particular type of relationship between uh, two creative people in a very specific field um you know initially i did wonder that if there you know and in, in, maybe in an early draft of the film there was kind of um an inkling of would this be romantic between them and then it kind of quickly becomes clear that it wouldn't be as he you know goes into his state but when um, I wanted to leave it open to see what the natural organic chemistry was going to be between the two actors that we ended up casting. And when Simon and Juno showed up together, it was just instantly clear that they had that friendship connection without it being anything else. And it was, you know, so believable and natural. And, you know, and I think that, you know, if you're in that creative space, you have mentors that are much older than you, or they're opposite sexes, and it's just never about that. They're, you're connecting on a totally different level. So. Yeah, that's, yeah, I was, you know, I was very pleased. And and also too, like, you know, the feedback with, from the actors, like they definitely felt like we can get to that level of connection without it having to be romantic. Mm -hmm. um, Simon Pegg, the rare non-comedic role, and he's terrific in it, in, in, in this dramatic role. You know, what made you think that, that what did you see in Simon that, that made him the right Thea? Yeah, I mean, I think again, like I'm always sort of interested in seeing things the different way than, uh, you know, stories a different way than has been portrayed before. I, I kind of similarly like to look at actors and see them in a different way that, you know, people have seen them in. And, and I, you know, I, I like to kind of think how I could break somebody in a different way. And with Simon, to me, it was, you know, the depth of his talent was very clear, just also because he was, I, you know, I, I know him to be, a, you know, a writer himself. And there and there's parts in various films that he has done where you see moments of, you know, his dramatic qualities. And I think that, um, I think it was the film The World's End, the third in the Coronado trilogy, where he is playing this kind of with nail and eye character. And he um, rolls up into Nick Frost's office and he's, trying to convince him to go on that last pub crawl and tells him that his mom died and he's completely lying, but he's so good at like doing that dramatic moment of being sad and saying that his mom died and he's totally pulling his leg. But I was like, oh, that's really good. Like, I want to see more of that. So um, that's what made me think of Simon also too, because he had that, quali that quality of humor that this character that was baked into this character from, you know, the original inspiration and who it was based on and how it was written. And I just knew that Simon was, a, you know, a good enough actor to be able to deliver the humor, you know, walk the line between delivering humorous moments and the real moments. And yeah, and he and he really did. Right. Um, you you were uh, born here in Santa Barbara and then went to Wells Wellesley College and um, started working in the industry. You were um, an assistant writer was it for uh, uh, writing assistant with kids in the hall and you actually worked with Joe and Anthony Russo uh, yeah. you know you know tell us about working for the Russo brothers they're great they're real gents you know um they are you know they're just really wonderful people to work with and that was I think after they had done Arrested Development and Community and you know this was a show called Carpoolers that I think lasted one season but it's just, some, yeah, it was just kind of amazing because I was, you know, I was a writing assistant and kind of there in the room when they went, you know, through the process of um, taking the film to the network and studio. And um, it's just been amazing to see how they've just come to dominate the industry since. And that on that show, um, 
you know, I met Thomas Middleditch and TJ Miller, who, because um, TJ was in that show too. He was, we cast him out of Second City. So it was, uh, it's been really incredible to see, you know, everybody's trajectory since then. You know, those guys went on to do Silicon Valley and these huge movies since. So, yeah, it's, um, there's definitely some, some magic that was, you know, waiting to bloom on, the, on that job for sure. And what did you learn from them? Um, I was, I was debating whether or not to go to film school. I had applied and I had gotten in and I was a writing assistant on that show. And I was, you know, kind of being like, well, you know, like I could stay in this track and I can, you know, and try to work my way up. And, but it kind of depended on these uh, variable factors. And then, um, or I could go to film school and really focus on my own writing and directing. And um, Anthony said to me, he's like, always, he's like, when you have to make a decision like that, he's like, always bet on yourself, you know? And that decision for me was betting on myself to develop myself, to become a better writer, become a better director and not have to be sort of beholden to these other forces. Like, would I get promoted? Would I, you know, would I be able to be a writer in the room? Like all this other stuff that was kind of going on and political at that, you know, at that moment on that job. So that was the decision I made. And I'm really glad that I did. It was a really good piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, let's take a look at the, at the automatic hate, which you wrote in uh, 2015. And uh, we're going to see the scene with the late Ricky Jay, who's terrific. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I've just been watching him in Deadwood recently. Yes. Mm -hmm. Automatic hate. Um, do you need help with something? Just some red label. He's down there? Yeah. Wow. How'd you pull that off? It's easy to despise someone from a distance. Put them across the table, though. Most men won't pursue a conflict if they can help it. Your dad's a great example. Of what? A coward. Wow, really. Yeah, he's he's terrific in this. Um, again, this film I I I love, and it has a tricky tone. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you navigate serial com comedy. Um, what is you know you know tell us about about writing this. Yeah, that was a film that I wrote with a, a very good friend of mine, Justin Lerner, and it was that was based on some something that happened with him where he found out um, that he had a part of his family that he never knew about. And I think he received a, a Christmas card from the learners who were dressed as sort of like sexy Santa helpers. And he was like, wait, who are these people? And then he realized that he had cousins and an uncle he never knew about. And I was like, wow, that's a good beginning for a story. And um, asked if, you know, he'd want to, you know, write it. And so um, it became its own thing. And it had this sort of, you know, became, had we had to invent the, the our own skeleton in the closet for why that family in the movie broke apart and you know it's it's twisted in its own right not and that's not the story of my of Justin's but um but yeah it was it was a you know really great experience I mean that film I think we were definitely writing it for Justin especially since it was serving you know something that was close to you know his own personal story so it was um you know great to be in service of that and um you know it just was a real educational experience for me because you know um you know justin was a few years ahead of me and he was just a, a really great person to learn from and he's one of my very best friends and um and it was yeah it just seems like ages ago now the world just seems so different it's it's amazing to revisit that clip and just be taken back so much has changed you did um other than uh co-writing co the script you also did set decorating correct mm -hmm. in the film you know tell us about that experience yeah that you know we were upstate new york near like cooperstown oneonta and it was really you know i um you know again it's just one of these little indies where it's like all hands on deck like everybody's doing multiple jobs doing what you can and i wanted um 
you know, to be able to, you know, help in, in a different way as, uh, and also be there on set for him and help with any sort of revisions, last minute revisions with the writing or feedback and, you know, be able to be there for him as a, a sounding board as needed. And that job sort of, um, it, it definitely allowed for that, but it's, uh, I think that for that film in particular, the the half of the family that um, Joe Cross is from is was based on Justin's side of the family, and the half that is you know um, that they go to visit in upstate New York just drew information from my side of the family, which is sort of more you know Bohemian Santa Barbara, you know lived on you know ranches and and stuff. So there was I pulled a lot of. Um, things that I could, you know, you go to upstate New York and then people just want to do, roll out the red carpet to help you with the canon, like lend you, the antique, so many antique dealers up there, like that just lent us um, stuff that we just borrowed their furniture. And so, I, you know, when I was going around pulling things out, that was definitely an inspiration, was that sort of bohemian factor, because the greens, they're out in the wild and that's what they kind of represent as sort of the the id, if you will. So that was, you know, kind of an inspiration for the the, the design of that film. I meant to ask you when we were talking about lost transmissions is that you have a lot of experience as an editor. Um, and, you know, and I, I wanted to ask you about working on the editing for lost transmissions. Is mm -hmm. that, is that something that you were very much involved um, in? And, you know, just if you could talk to us about your editing process. Yeah, I mean, definitely sitting in there every day, you know, with the editor and, you know, there was two of them and they both did a great job and it was, um, yeah, again, it's, uh, you know, it's just an ever evolving process and editing for me is like probably the hardest place. I think, I think partially because I, I, I write something then I, you know, especially if you're writing and then directing and then editing, you have, and you're writing something that was based on something you went through. There's a lot of stages of you know detachment that you have to go through you know um mm -hmm. and I, the original story had a lot more uh, people involved and just the keeping involved and and engrossed in, in the emotional journey like we had to kind of keep honing it down to just simon and juno and so that was a big part of the breaking you know like i think every director gets broken in the edit process and you kind of have to go through that death and then kind of and you know kind of come alive again and um, finding what the film what the film is that you got versus what you you went in hoping to get and and it's like how successfully can you navigate those tricky waters is you know is is a big part to like how the film turns out and I think that you know that's why it's so important to have an editor because they see you at the moment like you you have a plan every other part of the film but there comes a part in the edit where I think if you're really intimate with the director, you they've dropped their flashlight and they're in the dark and they don't know and they have to like, you're with them, you're right there with them, like having to discover it with them and and give them the space to find it. So that was, you know, I think that's, um, that that was a big way that the film changed. The, again, like kind of mentioned, like find, dialing in like the tone and the humor and that's, um, yeah, it's the you know the edit is a fascinating, fascinating place to be. You you mentioned that that a, a director is broken down during the editing process. Can you can you elaborate on that? I think it's just um, again because I at least I do you know like I have such a plan for everything I want, and and then when I think there just comes a moment when you know you have like producers breathing down your shoulders and you have you know, that you, you kind of string together everything you got and, you know, no, you know, things are obviously you're like, there's going to be some golden things that are working some are not, and you're trying to piece them together and you don't exactly know what the, how the puzzle is going to fit yet. So you're sitting there and that's when you feel like you're in the dark, you know, you don't really see, you can't really quite see ahead to your plan anymore. Um, and that's when you kind of, you're kind of broke, like the, I think it, you get broken down as a director in the sense that you, you're broken down in everything that your vision was for it and you have to be able to let go and then refine this new vision. So that's, um, I think that's always a tumultuous moment in, in the process for any director, yeah. yeah. I, when I was introducing you, I mentioned that you've done um, 
a lot of uh, short films and I, I actually want the audience to take a peek at um, a scene from uh, Breaking News, which uh, a short you directed in, a very prescient short that you directed in 2018. Uh, let's take a look at Breaking News. God. All right, we gotta get out of here. I'm gonna call help. Just calm down. I'm gonna call help. Here we go. Greeting <clears throat> service in here. Greetings. This is Peter Donegan. I'm here with a group of pundits at the PCB building. Now we are trapped in an elevator which could drop at any second. Are you live streaming this, man? Now, I'm not sure what happened exactly. There was some sort of power outage, uh, perhaps some kind of terrorist attack. We're not sure we're investigating the situation as we speak. Billy Price Hello, declaring a state of emergency. I'm here at the PCB building okay, in what just... might be my last broadcast. Has anyone called maintenance? Uh, look, hi, Mom. Yeah, I'm going to be late. I'm We're stuck in the elevator. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Back. I just heard from my viewers that there was, in fact, a terrorist attack. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been confirmed. A terrorist attack has occurred at the PCB building. We don't know. There has been a terrorist attack at the PCB How building. How many have confirmed. been injured or if there are any save ourselves mm -hmm. yes. left oh alive? Okay. okay, could you all just, just, just be quiet? Just, just pitch for one second, okay? I'm going to be passed in live to the CGT network. Mm -hmm. Okay, what did, find out what they say. Yeah, okay, hang on one second. Hello, Nancy, yes, yes. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. It is true. We are fearing for our lives as we speak. Who else are you in there with? Well, I'm here with uh, PCB anchor uh, Carol uh, Carol Kelly. Kerrigan. Uh, Kerrigan, I'm sorry. And with uh, Billy Pay Billy Price, Price, is that right? Billy Price. Of the Christian Lobbying Committee. Now, please get one of our families. Banks. Michael the Banks. Banks. Come on. Bank. Debbie, yeah. Debbie, if you're watching, I love Hello, you. It's all going to be... Hello, Nancy. I am please, please? here, and we have enough oxygen. <laughs> This is um, unlike anything that you've done before. Um, I love the fact that it, I mentioned that it's so prescient. You know, you deal with Twitter about you <laughs> deal with fake news and misinformation, et cetera. You know, yeah. can you can you tell us about your the the genesis of this short? Well, that short has never actually been released. So you just debuted it, actually. Oh, I, my God. <laughs> yeah, I just. Uh, really? I yeah. mean, you didn't because it's so I I I love this short. Thanks. I'm surprised I really like you. It too. I mean, the reason that we didn't it was that because I shot it right before we shot Lost Transmissions. And um, like I was like in the act of shooting it when we got the green light of I mean, for, for Lost Transmissions to be a go. And I was just advised by my my team to not send that around with lost transmissions because they're so stylistically different and that can be confusing when you're trying to sort of introduce yourself um you know as a writer director so i kind of wish i just put it on vimeo back in the day um you know and not held it because we held it to like send it around to festivals but then obviously you know my world became about lost transmissions so we just didn't release it but it was um it was a really fun short and the weird thing about it too is that we shot that short i don't know if you remember that how there was that fake mm, missile scare in Hawaii. Correct. Yeah. I, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. So the day that we go into, I forgot, like we shot that in like the scene in building in, in LA, I think, but we walk into the lobby in the morning to shoot that film and we look up on the news monitors and there's exactly like playing out is like the missile, like is this fake news thing going on of, or a false alarm event of this, missile crisis happening in Hawaii and it was just one of those bizarre moments like you roll in with like your donuts and coffee like you know from craft services and you're just like this is so bizarre we're just about to make the short film that's about what is going on right now and so it you know once again like I've been kind of wary about writing because it seems like everything I write like comes true um but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's why I want to do the romantic comedy next but it's um yeah I I, I got I maybe I'll just put it on YouTube now because I, oh you I, can I, still you can still yeah. submit it to mm -hmm. film festivals it's, it's, since it has it's not premiered anywhere it yeah. is par it is powerful Catherine and and what I love about it is the uh, comedic timing it <laughs> you know it it becomes farcical and oh yeah uh, especially at the end yeah especially at the end was yeah. it was it fun uh directing it it, it all for those who haven't <laughs> seen it it all most of it takes place inside the elevator with the four pundits stuck in the elevator yeah um, sort of what happens when you get four news pundits stuck in, in the elevator you know it's it's funny you know i think also too i became to be perfectly honest i think like things got so heated politically after the film between like right and left and everybody going at each other's throats, which 
is a pun I use when, especially when you know what happens at the end of the, of the short, right. but um, yeah, again, I think like, I was just like, I was just fatigued and I didn't want to like put something out that was just going to inflame commentary. You know what I mean? I was just like, I just felt like burying my head from all that stuff. Um, but it still is, you know, it still feels hugely relevant because I think that even that we've moved out of that, you know, heated political time after the election, we're still seeing how the news media is this, this fear generating machine that is just, ha it's just dividing us apart. And, and it, it needs to, we need to start, you know, kind of holding the news accountable for the way that it's influencing society. And I think that's, you know, that's what I was trying to do with this, with this short, yeah. It's, it's highly cinematic, um, but it is, as I mentioned, it's contained to that elevator. Um, was that have, a, yeah. Sorry, was it was it a challenge to 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 make it cinematic? Um, was, yeah, I mean, we had a great cinematographer, um, um, Bartosz Nalazak. Again, he's a he's a Polish cinematographer. I love my I love my Eastern Europeans. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he. Um, you know, he just made it look, he just made it look as, you know, he easy, you know, to shoot in that elevator. Again, he's somebody who can, you know, really um, roll up to any situation and, and make it look really, really sparkling. But um, it, it was just a great time because we have some great actors in that. I don't know if you recognize them, but we have another actor from Deadwood, Larry yeah. Sanders, and then also an actor from The Wire, who Bubbles. And then an actor from Glow, my good friend Brita, and then um, an actor from All My Children. So they were just, you know, it was easy because they could just deliver. Like we're tight, we could get in there, get everything we wanted from those guys, and they were just having a ball, climbing on top of each other. So yeah, that was fun. Um, I've I've enjoyed so much talking to you. I could go on for another hour chatting. Um, I, I I do have one final question for those who are listening and are interested in going to film school, did you find it, um, you know, that the fact that you had experience um, working as a writer before you went to graduate school, is that something that you would recommend to actually get out there, get some experience and then go to graduate school for film? Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so funny. Everything's changed so much, you know, since then, because again, like social media has taken over and people are generating, you know, everybody's a filmmaker now in their TikTok videos and stuff. So um, I really, I personally really loved film school. I felt like I got a lot out of it. I thought it made me a better writer and a better director. Um, I, um, I recommend it for the network that you get from the friends, because that's just as valuable as anything else is because you need to it's a collaborative medium you need to have an, you know people to you know editors and other writers and cinematographers that you meet and I think when you go to film school everybody's at the stage where they're all in need of favors and pulling favors for other people so you're actually able to draw on that resource and and they just happen to be some of like you know that's you know most talented people in the country so I definitely think film schools is is worthwhile um that being said, I also think that now, like, there's like, you can go out and shoot, you know, movies on your iPhone and, and just get started. And I'm just also, you know, all for, all for, you know, embracing the way that people are seeing and consuming things. I think it's changing now. So um, whichever way people want to go about it, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I think both are, are great. And in terms of having experience before film school, I don't think you necessarily have to. I think it's helpful to know what you want to do going in, but you also kind of discover that at film school just because you have to wear so many different hats. So um, I think it's it's perfectly fine just to kind of jump in. I, I just think that either way, you just got to get your hands on a camera and just be writing um, and making films because you can now, and, and that's just the best way to learn. Great. Well, Catherine, I'm a fan and I can't wait to see what comes next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I've been and a fan of yours for so long and you bring so much to Santa Barbara, our little community here um, with the way that you've guided the festival over the years and really made it um, that just uh, one of the best things Santa Barbara has to offer. So thank oh, you. Well, well, you're too kind. You're very kind. Well, thank you. Thank you again for this conversation and 
can't wait to see you again very soon. Yeah, same. Take care. Thank you, Catherine.